We have a quorum. We do. Hi, everyone. We're in session. It's 2 o'clock. And look who's here. Oh, my gosh, the rain brought you. I love it. <laughs> Wonderful. Okay, folks. It's two and we're ready. Did you solve this problem? Good. All right, all's well. I am going to call to order. We're here we are. I'm going to call to order the January 22nd, 2024 Commission for the Las Vegas Centennial Board Meeting. Here. <laughs> oh, look who's here. Hi, boss. How are you? Just fine. Your plaza is coming along just fine. The what? Are we in compliance with the open meeting law, Madam Clerk? Yes, we are. Thank you. May we do a roll call, please? Yes, ma'am. Chair Goodman? I'm here. Commissioner Bryan? He's here. I saw him. <laughs> <laughs> Commissioner Arnold? Here. Commissioner Stodal? Present. Commissioner Brown? Commissioner Coffin? Here. Commissioner Helton? Here. Commissioner Sinak? Here. Commissioner Mowbray? Here. Commissioner Truesdale? Here. Commissioner Brandenburg? Here. Commissioner Creer? Present. Commissioner Mills? Present. Commissioner Prado? Commissioner Diaz? Here. Thank you. We do have a quorum. Wow. I just opened your door. That's beautiful. Sorry, I just was distracted for a moment. This is a lovely day. Happy New Year, everyone. And we're going to have our first public comment. This portion of the agenda must be limited to matters on the agenda for action. If you wish to be heard, please give your name for the record. The amount of discussion as well as the amount of time any single speaker is allowed may be limited. Are you sure you don't want to speak under this portion of the agenda? Okay, I'm going to close the first public comment. We're going to move on to agenda item four for possible action to approve the final minutes by reference of the meeting of the November 27th, 2023. And may I have a motion, please? Sold off for the record, make a motion to approve the minutes. Second. Okay, and we have a second by the governor oh, and no, the no. third by our <laughs> commission member, uh, Mowbray. Yes. And that motion, all vote, please signify by aye or if Aye. you can vote, Aye. we can't do it. Aye. All right, we're I, everybody. <laughs> Thank you. Is anybody opposed? No? <laughs> we're good. It's still circling. We're so much better than computer. Okay, agenda item five, report by the City of Las Vegas Finance Department staff regarding the Commission for the Las Vegas Centennial Budget, fiscal year 2024. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Mayor and Commissioners. I'm here to present the financial information for the centennial as of December 31st, 2023, which is six months into uh, the fiscal year. So today we have collected revenues of $631,000 and spent pr uh, program expenditures of $760,000. Uh, resulting in a net decrease in net assets of $145,000. And then um, that brings us to net assets ending of $6.5 million. I did want to point out that we also have the YouTube revenues uh, presented here. Today we have, uh, we collected $25,000. Um, it's under the miscellaneous income line item. Quick question, still over the record. Uh, do you have any, uh, off the top of your head, any tracking record on the YouTube? Is that leveling out, going up, going down? Do uh, you have any s sense of that? Um, I do not. We can check with maybe the communications department and see if they have um, anything like that. Okay. So just be interesting to see if the, we're still getting the same dollars on a regular basis. We have to get together for lunch. Yeah. Gotcha, yeah, we can look into that for you. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions, comments? 
Okay, uh, this is a report. Do we need uh, approval on this? No, just a report only. Thank you very much. Thank you. Appreciate it. We'll move on to agenda item number six. One second, get rid of all my papers. Item number 230605, CLC 1, advance item discussion for possible action regarding the funding in the amount of $1,450,760.68 to Boyd Productions to produce part seven through part 10 of the documentary series, City of Las Vegas, covering the years 1970 through 2005. And Mr. Stoddall, I think you have a comment. Well, Mayor, I plan to make a motion to approve the funding for this final set of decade documentaries for the city of Las Vegas. This would cover the funding for the complete set of documentaries for the first century of the city of Las Vegas. In reviewing the minutes of last November's Centennial Commission meeting, the reason this matter was abated had to do with three basic questions about this grant. The overall question about funding additional decade documentaries to complete the 100 years or to just do the 70s or stop completely. The second question dealt with questions about the cost increases for each decade documentary over the next four years, and of course the cost uh, of everything has gone up, and that is built into the, uh, uh, the annual budget for the next four years within the proposal. And the third, a question about the existing contracts that call for the delivery of all the raw footage and any material the city paid for the rights of the, the photographs or, or the video. There was a question largely on my part and some confusion on my part as to whether that part of the contract had been satisfied by Boyd, since I had not seen any of the material used by the city's TV station or the communication department. Following the meeting, I was assured by staff that in fact the Boyd group had lived up to all aspects of the contract. So as part of the commemoration of the first 100 years of the town and the city of Las Vegas, I think the Centennial Commission should approve the funding of the documentaries about the development of the city for the first 100 years, 1905 to 2005. The stop with the 1960s just doesn't make sense to me. Uh, I believe the approved funding increases include in the budget is reasonable. Therefore, I'd like to make a motion to approve agenda item 623-0605, CLC1, approve the funding in the amount of 1, $1, $1,450,760.68 to Boyd Production to produce parts seven, eight, and nine, and 10 of the documentary series on the city of Las Vegas, covering the years 1970 through 2005. And that was very clearly done, and since your questions were the ones that have been answered, um, I see people nodding their heads. May I have a second to that motion? Thank you, thank you, Ms. Helton. Any comments, question, before I move to the question here? All in favor, signify You're right. by- Can I ask a question? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, uh, is this unprecedented for us to approve decades? I recall basically, and I could be wrong, that we approved one decade at a time, the 60s, the Correct. 50s, the that 40s. that is what we did. Why is this different? What's the rationale for that, if I'm, if I'm correct in my assumption that we just approved it a decade at a time? Uh, so off for the record, I think this started with the, uh, the Plaza Hotel. Yeah. And it was at that point that the commission felt that rather than the, these groups coming back that we had approved and, and had received reports uh, to our satisfaction on how the money was spent and what it was spent for, yep. that we approved uh, the rodeo, Las Vegas days, Hell Rodeo days uh, at the plaza, I think for three years. Uh, we've also did the same, I believe, with two other uh, uh, where we did multiple years and there's a, another one on today's agenda, I believe, uh, for the home and uh, history tour by the Nevada yes. Foundation. Yes, yes, yes. sir. And is. so I think this just sort of falls in line right. with that. Okay, you're comfortable? Thank you. Okay, I'm gonna move the question unless there's any other comment. All right, all in favor signify by aye, please. Aye. 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 Any aye. opposed? Did anybody abstain? Motion carries unanimously, and how nice to see you. Congratulations. Thank you. Um, happy New I Year. I had the speech prepared. Wait. <laughs> I didn't let you off the hook. Please introduce yourself to those of us who may not remember who you are. 
Hello, I'm Hi. Jennifer Boyd. I'm the owner of Boyd Productions. And it really is, I just have to say, it is an honor to be able to tell these stories. And it is something that we don't take lightly. We understand how important this is. And we really appreciate the funding because it gives us the time to do the thorough research uh, that a, a lot of people just simply wouldn't have the time. And we are very aware that down the road, uh, others may use this as source material for their new works that they create. So we do take this very seriously, and, and I thank you for uh, having trust in us to tell this story. Well, we congratulate you. We're delighted. I have to tell you, even to see the first one or the second one again and again and again each time I watch, there's something new to pick up that I missed the first time around or the second time around. So we look forward to this. Um, what uh, are you going to start right away, I'm sure? Yes, actually, right now we have the 1960s is in the edit suite as we are, are speaking right now. And obviously, that'll be completed in, in May. And then, yes, we would get started on the research for the 1970s. And uh, what's your timeline? Or was that given to us, uh, Dr. Seabrandt? for the completion now that we've moved to this stage? Yes, it's, it's in the proposal uh, when we would deliver various uh, uh, points, okay. whether it's rough draft, uh, treatment, rough draft, uh, um, shooting, and um, edits all along for uh, the first two. And it's meant to show a, a system in place of when one is in the other, in the edits suite, the okay. other research is taking place for the next decade. And we need to celebrate that there have been 10.6 million views of this series as of last week, just on YouTube alone. The, wow, terrific. Wow. Yeah. That is awesome. Yeah. Yeah. So congratulations Thank to you, you um, please, and everybody on commission. This is really a step in the right direction, and we look forward to seeing what you have done each step of the way. So thank you, Dr. Seabrant team. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, and because of that, I'm going to take the uh, motion. I better read it in first. I'm going to strike number seven. Your Honor, could I just ask one question? You can do whatever yeah, you want. You're the senator and the governor. the last time, the COLA, the cost of living adjustment. Is that something the city puts in all of its contracts, or is that something the party that the city is contracting with insists upon? I, that's... Uh, once upon a time, I looked at contracts more closely, and... Maybe, maybe, sir, you could answer the Jeff question. Jeff Dorkak, City Attorney. The short answer is there's no COLA built in to the contract. It's uh, essentially the, I believe, the amount divided by four films, seven, eight, nine, ten, yeah. And uh, if you were the production company, you would bring that to the table, a COLA issue. If, if you thought you were going to sure, need okay. some type of thing, you bring it to the table, clearly it either wasn't brought as a COLA topic, or they built it into their sure. costs anyway. So, so to your so, direct so question, the answer is no, no COLA. That, it's not in the standard contract that the city uses, that, but maybe part of a bargaining uh, chip with respect to uh, the party that we're entering into the contract with to insist upon it because of the length of time and the inflation that we've had. So Correct. that's the understanding? Correct. Thank you very much, Jeff. I appreciate Thank that. You. Sorry, Your Honor, but I no just want to get that clarified. OK, item 7, 24. Yes, please. Uh, Member if I could. Coffin, yeah. Yeah, it's on that previous subject, but the vote has taken place and I approved. What I want to say is uh, I'm kind of an old student of history, and I would hope that we stop here on this gathering of history, because history is best defined by the people who didn't make the history. And um, as you well, you can imagine, you know, it's, it's we're too much of our own feelings and voice are transmitted to anybody who's recording us for so-called history. So I, I just wanted to make sure that I'm one of those who feels, to let you know, that I don't like these done in, in current time, because yeah. it's not history yet, if you will. Okay. I'm not a purist, I hope. I'm oh. just thinking there was a debate in history going on about that. It has been for generations, but that's my thought. OK, well, you've made a record. So thank you, Member Coffin. You're a matter of member of record here. So at this point, I'm going to read seven, but or do I not read it and just strike it? Uh, Jeff Dorkak, City Attorney, go ahead and read it and then make the motion yourself, ma'am. 
Okay, thank you. It's item number 724-0008, CLC1, discussion for possible action regarding funding in the amount of $351,989, excuse me, to Boyd Productions to produce part seven of the documentary film series, City of Las Vegas, covering the years 1970 to 1979. And therefore, I'm gonna move to strike that because we don't need it. Second, so, so long. Thank you. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Any abstention? Motion carries unanimously. Thank you. We'll move on to agenda item eight. 24-0010 CLC1, final report by staff from the City of Las Vegas Parks, Recreation and Cultural Affairs Department regarding the completion of the 100 year anniversary event for the historic West Side School loca located at 330 West Washington Avenue, funded by the Commission for the Las Vegas Centennial. This is Ward 5 with Councilman Creer. And um, we have a report coming. Noon. I'll just wait for my counterparts to come up here, but uh, in the meantime, I'm Jasmine Freeman, uh, Cultural Affairs Manager for Parks, Recreation, and Cultural Affairs here at the City of Las Vegas. And today we're going to be um, giving you a recap of the Centennial Celebration. Wonderful, and here's the rest okay. of your wonderful team. So the rest Good of afternoon. Uh, <laughs> yes, oh, we you have are, Ms. Madam. Name? I'm sorry. Your name, please, for Brenda Williams, West Las Vegas. <laughs> I'm Jonathan Mesa, Cultural Affairs Manager. Thank you. Welcome. Happy New Year. Okay. Jasmine, are you starting? Yes. I'm going to get us started, and we are here just to share a recap with you of the uh, historic West Side School Centennial Celebration that happened last year, and of course, extend our gratitude to the Commission for funding that um, grant request that we put forth last year. Um, so the historic West Side School Centennial Celebration was proudly presented in partnership by the City of Las Vegas and the West Side School Alumni Foundation and of course funded by the Commission for the Las Vegas Centennial and it was a momentous event that successfully encapsulated a century of history, community pride and cultural preservation. Um, we had festivities that commenced with a vibrant, vibrant parade featuring notable presenters that included Councilman Cedric Creer, uh, Dr. Lawrence Weekly, Mr. Craig Knight, uh, and of course, Ms. Brenda Williams and Reverend Gerald Mason. So I wanted to share with you um, a little bit about the parade event. My counterpart, Jonathan, will share about the festival. And of course, Ms. Williams uh, has some wonderful insights to share with us as well. And we do have a video for this presentation. Um, I wanna let you know that as the parade unfolded, highlights showcased the legacy of the historic West Side School from significant contributions of alumni uh, to the acknowledgement of key community organizations, churches connected to this iconic institution and more. Ms. Williams, would you like to take Okay, when we came before you last year, uh, we were excited. Uh, to make the presentation about the historic West Side School and the diversity of the individuals who attended there, not only just uh, by race, but by religion, by culture. And so you funded that and it was a wonderful event. Uh, we're very, very proud to uh, have been at the forefront of having, um, helping the West Side School become a uh, historic site, national, state, and city historic site. And uh, I wanna jump forward a few minutes if I can. Okay. Uh, two of our members passed away uh, during, uh, after, actually subsequent to the parade and festival. And one was Miss Audrey E. James. She was the oldest living teacher from the historic West Side School. She was in the parade she was excited about it. She was 109 years old with all of her faculties about her. Now, I was a very good friend of hers. So after the fact, she says, you know, Brenda, I'm really excited about having been in that parade because, you know, she was in the UNLV parade and they made her the 
whatever, but the grand poopa with the crown and all, she wore that in our parade. She said, but I'm sorry about the attendance. The people didn't come out. I said, well, I think overall we accomplished what we set out to accomplish, and that is to provide the parade and the festival. So I told her, I said, but you know, you might just be energized by the fact that the people might not have shown up, but our own United States Senator, Catherine Mestos, presented a congressional record before the 118th Congress, which says that the world knows we exist. And I'm gonna just read a couple of things from it, uh, if I can find my glasses, okay. One day I can't hear, the next one I can't see. That's when you get 80, that's what happens. Oh, excuse me, you guys know that. Okay, this says, <laughs> <laughs> the congressional record, proceedings and debates on the 118th Congress first session. Uh, and it's the Senate honoring the historic West Side School. Ms. Catherine Cortez Mesto, Mesto. Mr. President, I rise today to commemorate the centennial celebration of the historic West Side School in Las Vegas, Nevada. This school holds a special place in the history of Las Vegas and is a symbol of resilience, education, and strength in the community. And I'm gonna fast forward to the end. It says, I commend the city of Las Vegas and the Historic West Side School Alumni Foundation for their dedication to preserving the memory of this historic school and for organizing the centennial celebration. It truly is an opportunity for our community to come together, learn from our past, and work together to a brighter future where equality and opportunity are accessible to all, signed by our own U.S. Senator. And this is very important. As Senator Bryan knows, we did very few of those and the ones that we did were very, very important. So with that, I just wanted to share a copy with you. The next person that, so Ms. Audrey was excited about that. The next person that passed away is a very good friend of mine. Uh, probably, I, I know he's probably one of two black millionaires in Las Vegas. His name was Sammy Armstrong, owner of the first minority bus company in the state of Nevada, and I might say that in the state, uh, in the United States of America. Mm -hmm. uh, he was also the founder of the, um, of the Calvary Troop, the Buffalo Soldiers. So Sammy was not an alumni, but he was instrumental in helping me make decisions and just keeping me calm when I was stressed out and just offering what he could, as he always has, to the city of Las Vegas and the state of Nevada. And Sammy passed on um, October the 23rd. I talked to him the day before. He, and I was gonna call him back, and then I called back. He had already left us, so time is always of essence. I just wanted to share that with you. I wanna go forward. Next, oh, my microphone's on? Oh, now it is, okay. Thank you, Ms. Brenda. Um, next up, we would like to show you what the day looked like uh, with this video that was done by our own KCLV Channel 2. And um, as Ms. Brenda had mentioned, yes, the, the turnout um, did look a little, a little less than we had anticipated for the day of the parade morning. Um, we had some weather we were contending with. It, was a, it, it, it looked like it wanted to rain on us all day. Thankfully, it did not. Um, we were able to pull some data and uh, with a tool that we have called Placer AI and found out that we had 3,000 attendees out for the parade and festival. So it really was a fantastic <coughs> turnout um, and hoped you know, that we would have had more people, but of course the ones that came had a fantastic time. So we're gonna show you this video. It was an 
unusually cool and cloudy day, September 30th, but nothing was going to rain on this parade. I think we hear our first entries coming down. I'm happy about how it's lining up and the people are showing up and they're pleased to be out here. They're happy. It's energizing. I mean, it brings excited. Uh, excited about participating as a community, a Las Vegas community. This was the parade and party celebrating the 100th anniversary of the historic West Side School, a school steeped in history, stories, and prominent graduates. Some of those graduates, along with all who are proud of this newly rehabilitated school, were here to show that pride. The celebration is magnificent, and I feel it's a wonderful turnout for the 100 year anniversary. Queen of the parade, Miss Audrey James, a former teacher at the school, 109 years old and still looking like royalty. She literally brought the crowd to their feet. Everybody on your feet. She is 109 years young, Greg. Young, that's right. She surpassed the legacy of the school. But this was not only a time for the older generations to reminisce. It was time for the entire community across the generations to celebrate, including sports teams from local high schools. Blue Knights on three. One, two, three. Blue Knights! We don't always get to come out and do things like this. But now, you know, we have my team, a whole bunch of people. We're just coming in, coming together as a community. And I think it's just a beautiful thing. To the Golden Knights and the Las Vegas Raiders. Las Vegas Fire and Rescue represented yesterday and today with Big Red carrying council members Cedric Creer and Olivia Diaz, followed by state-of-the-art equipment and members of our esteemed fire department today, including Fire Chief Fernando Gray. The parade culminated at the historic West Side School with a full program, including music and dancers and a celebration of the Southern Paiutes. And for our Southern Paiute people to be a part of this, we've been a part of this 100 years ago. Our people were amongst the first students. Councilman Cedric Creer, who represents this area of the city, reminded those in attendance this was indeed a time to celebrate the school's rich history. You know, the city put about $16 million into the school for to rehab it in 2006. Um, we made it we, inside of the school. You're going to see some uh, the original flooring and the original classroom. But it's also a time to look forward to its future. We've advanced the school a lot. We have KCP is located here at the school. They broadcast from here. We have our design center, if you haven't seen it yet, which has a history and a background of the entire historic West Side, which is fantastic. And I urge you to go in and take a look at that. We have classrooms of staff. We have businesses that are relocated here. This day was a celebration of the past, the present, and the future, not only for this neighborhood, but for the city as a whole. The school happens to be located right in the historic West Side in Ward 5. But this is a citywide celebration. Uh, this is the oldest school in the history of Las Vegas. We're recognizing that. Nancy Byrne here. I hope you enjoyed that story. For more great stories about the city of Las Vegas, don't forget to click on that box. So I don't want to be repetitive of the video, but um, as you can see, this was really a col colorful and vibrant spectacle featuring a diverse lineup um, of entries that showcase the rich tapestry of our Las Vegas history and our community. We were really lucky to have um, 46 entries, and that list of entries were by invite only. So uh, Miss Brenda Williams from the West Side School Alumni Foundation, president of the Alumni Foundation, was uh, um, able to curate a listing of those institutions here with, throughout the valley that um, have a tie to the school and that would um, make up a wonderful parade for the community. And so we were able to have 46 entries. Remember when we came before you, um, we had anticipated about 50. So we were right in there around that mark. We had a couple fall out the day of the event that couldn't make it due to last minute things. Um, but we still marched on and had a fantastic event. We had community members, alumni, sports teams, marching bands, school clubs, dance groups, car clubs, local businesses, cultural groups. Um, as you can see, it was a great mix. And of course, we even had uh, local government. 
We had the Vegas, uh, Vegas Golden Knights, our uh, Stanley Cup champions were there. We also had the Las Vegas Raiders, um, the, and we had the National Bar Association of Las Vegas chapter. Um, it was just a broad spectrum of participants, and it really blended the historic representation, community engagement, and cultural celebration, making it a really memorable and inclusive event for our city. We also were able to provide a plaque to each and every uh, participant, not only who entered the parade, but those that participated in the festival. And we also supplied a plaque for the Centennial Commission through uh, Ms. or Dr. Diane C. Brent for your uh, records as well. And then our next slide here um, is just sharing a little bit more. Here's the faces of both Ms. Audrey E. James and Mr. Sammy Armstrong. And thank you, Brenda, for sharing their stories earlier. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, Jonathan, I'm gonna pass it over to you to talk about the festival. Good afternoon, commissioners. Uh, Jonathan Meza, cultural affairs manager. I oversee performing arts and arts education programming. Uh, I wanna start off by saying thank you for allowing us to program and showcase such a wonderful and culturally, culturally important event, such as what occurred on September 30th of last year at the Historic West Side School. Uh, firstly, this event would not have been possible without the help of Dr. Seabrent and the commission uh, for allowing us to utilize the necessary resources. Uh, secondly, uh, the incredible help of our very own own Las Vegas pioneer, Ms. Brenda Williams, a former city of Las Vegas councilwoman. Without her wrangling help and consulting, none of this would have been possible. This was her project, uh, this was her baby, uh, and it was an honor for our team to be associated with. Uh, lastly, but certainly not at the least, I just wanted to thank uh, everyone on my team that made this possible. Uh, the beautiful outcome of this festival and event was made possible by a team of six full-time staff members, and these are their names. Lisa Russell, Dr. Marcia Robinson from the West Las Vegas Art Center, Sandra Ward, Brian Garth, and Corey Goble, and Shayna Brown. They handled everything from logistics to food vendors, licensing, and of course, stage programming and coordination. All of this under the purview of what Dr. Seabrandt and Ms. Brenda Williams deemed best and necessary. Uh, jumping in here into the slides, we have our very own uh, former Brian Scott here on the slide representing the uh, Bar Association float. Uh, the heart of the celebration extended beyond the parade with a lively festival that captured that capti captivated attendees from 11 a.m. to 4 p.m. The festival was a culmination of performances, food vendors, and family-friendly activities uh, that added a dynamic touch to the historic occasion. Attendees were treated to a diverse array of cultural performances, including the Olabisi African Dance and Drum Ensemble from the West Las Vegas Art Center, bringing the rich traditions of West Africa to life. The event also it featured a heartfelt community prayer led by Reverend Gerald Mason. Next, Fawn Douglas uh, presented the Native American uh, tribe dancers showcasing the event's commitment to inclusivity and cultural diversity. And here in the next slide, we uh, special acknowledgments were made by Councilman Cedric Creer, recognizing the event sponsors such as the City of Las Vegas, the Commission for the Las Vegas Centennial, and the West Side School Alumni Foundation. The Alumni Foundation played a pivotal role in preserving the West Side School site and educating the public on its historic value. Attendees were invited to participate in guided tours and had the opportunity to purchase a compilation book featuring the West Side School alumni stories, experiences, photos, and artifacts. Uh, the celebration reached its pinnacle with the Henry J. Moore Award of Excellence uh, ceremony, which is what we see featured here, uh, honoring distinguished alum alumni who demonstrated unwavering commitment to preserving the legacy of the historic West Side School. Dr. Beatty, uh, Betty Henderson, Otis R.S. Otis R. Harris, Judy Simpson Banks, Patricia Book Feaster, and Nathaniel Whaley were recognized for their outstanding contributions. Um, as you can see in the photo displayed, we were also able to add uh, what you see there to the site that are, that's a historical significance. Um, did you want to say something on that? Uh, yes, I think we're talking about the plaque. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, since 1978, the Westside School alumni have been in the forefront and instrumental in the preservation and renovation of the historic Westside School. 
but surprisingly, there's no mention of the alumni on that campus. There's absolutely no plaque. Our book is not focused, and people all over the world read our book. But if you walk on that campus, you would not know that it was the alumni that signed that paperwork uh, for the National Historic Site back in 1978. And in, two, I think it was 2010, uh, 20, 2010, yes, is when I got started in the preservation and, and renovation uh, process, and have been doing that ever since. So I think that's another area that we need to address as a preservation society because of omission, of course, there is no history. So I am working on that now, and in doing so, I discovered, doing research, I discovered that the oldest the last teacher at Westside School was not Miss French, as is stated in the application, but it was Dr. James Pusley, who was a su associate sim superintendent of schools in 1967. He was the last principal at Westside School. So that needs to be changed. So I'm gonna correct it, because I'm writing some stuff, and, and stuff, I say, because it's a conglomeration of things. But one of them is going to be a story about en route to the parade, the processes and what we experienced. Uh, it, it's something uh, to, it, it needs to be written about. It needs to be adjusted. And uh, Mr. Stodall knows what I'm talking about. <laughs> We've had conversations, that's it. Oh, you want to go to these next? We didn't do that one. No, we didn't have any more. If Jeff's able to show, um, I don't know if overhead? there's any, any way to do show overhead. We had an addition of some photographs. Your Honor. There we go. Okay. Member Coffin, Thank please. you. I know this is a long pres presentation, and I don't want to slow it down. I just wanted to say that uh, I haven't spent a lot of time on the West Side this last 12 months working in a play as an actor uh, for Marietta Sales Clinton in that wonderful black gospel theater that she has. And we were there working that weekend. We weren't at the festival, but we were having a hard time getting people. We couldn't get people to be actors. Yes. It was horrible last year and also to attend. It was very hard to get people to attend. Bad weather seems like falling on the weekends all the time, mm -hmm. but I'm so impressed with what you have done, and I've lived here 72, 73 years, and I can tell you, I used to spend a lot of time on the west side in high school, drinking. However, I have really become re-energized about the west side, and, and I want to continue. I'll be continuing with her plays, and at the same time, being a white boy in a black gospel theater is an interesting concept, if you, you will. You did well in the play, though. I was there. No, oh, you saw it, yeah. Well, anyway, but it was fun. Okay. Just a lot of fun. Mayor, thank you. Sorry to slow down. The, I had to give some credit. No, 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 yeah, that's good. You want your PR, right? The li know. library was to receive the money. <laughs> the Las Vegas Black Gospel <laughs> Theater was part of the 100 celebration. Yes. Because the Gospel Theater was the first, uh, they presented the first play ever at the West Las Vegas uh, Theater in mm -hmm. 1995. And Mary Etta Sales Clinton, a Gorman, graduate yeah. and a West Las Vegas resident Go Gales, is yeah. the, uh, uh, she actually is the author, producer. And yes, I, I enjoyed meeting with you and thanks for lunch. <laughs> that was good. <laughs> thanks for your support. Thank you, Member Stodo, please. <laughs> Just one, one quick uh, a note uh, responding to uh, what Ms. Williams uh, said. Um, the City of Las Vegas Historic Preservation Commission working with Dr. Sebrand with funds provided by the Centennial Commission uh, is updating the, what, 50-year-old uh, National Register nomination for the West Side School. Uh, 50 years ago, it was able to get the school on the National Register, which opened the door for federal funds. But it's 50 years old, and it's, I don't want to say inaccurate, but it's inaccurate. Mm -hmm. uh, lots of information has come forward, 
And so that is being updated, and I think it should be finished by November of this year. Hopefully, oh, hopefully it'll be, uh, uh, and so that will provide a solid factual foundation working with, uh, with you. Okay. Uh, I, I would like to be a to, part of that. To make because sure that it is, that it is accurate. That aren't uh, there. Yeah, there are just so many stories that have been repeated three or four or a dozen, a hundred times about the school that are inaccurate. Mm -hmm. And the school deserves a factual foundation yes. of which to grow from and continue to survive. So, not survive, continue yeah. to blossom. Uh, so thank you for that. We should have it uh, done uh, by the end of this year. So, thank okay. you. Great. Your microphone uh, some, some is, of the, is off. I'm sorry. There you go. Um, these are some of the, some of our partners, some of our uh, church partners for the festival and the parade. Uh, we have um, uh, Victory Missionary Baptist Church, and uh, the that'll be the the, bi the whole the one the float with the Holy Bible, uh, and in right next to it the uh, with the balloons that is St. James Catholic Church. Uh, some of the two pivotal churches that were um, uh, present with us in, in the entire um, <laughs> festival and, and event. Yeah. I think since the churches were the feeder source uh, for the children that came to the school, that was appropriate to show, not just what is now. We're actually grateful for the Raiders and the Golden Knights for showing up. That's now. We need to talk about then because that was history and to leave them out would not be fair. So that's why I pulled up these photos to present today. Wonderful. We can go back to this slide now. You're good. And uh, just to finish off uh, my portion here, the event concluded with closing performances by the E.C. Adams Band, Ballet Folklorico de Mi Tierra, and Mariachi Alma del Sol, creating a vibrant tapestry of music, dance, and cultural uh, richness. The historic Westside School Centennial Celebration served as a testament to the community's dedication to preserving its heritage and fostering a sense of unity that will resonate for generations to come. If I might insert that we also had the Aaron Arrington uh, Gospel Choir. They had just returned from a trip in London and they came out and they performed for us and so it would only be fair that they be included in those who yes. entertained us. I mean, we went oh, to church, wonderful we went to Africa, celebration. we went everywhere. Wonderful okay. celebration all the way around and yes. great history there for anybody that um, comes to our town that thinks that we're just short-lived and Pop and pop, we are a lot deeper and a lot more than that. Okay. So thank you, and Jasmine, of course, thank you too. Um, appreciate it. And Miss Williams, you're always part of us. You know that you sat yeah. at this end of it all too, and so know that we appreciate all that you've taken charge of and made happen. So thank, thank you. you. Thank, thank you, you so much, much. Councilman. Thank you, uh, Member. Madam Chairwoman. Uh, one, I just want to congratulate uh, everybody on putting on an amazing event uh, to our team, and especially Ms. Williams. I can tell you, and I've said this before, uh, this whole celebration wouldn't have happened if it wasn't for Brenda Williams and bringing it to our attention and really bringing the awareness and putting in the hard work to uh, really make it happen. Uh, I, I had said that, you know, I thought the parade was excellent. Um, I hadn't thought about doing a parade, and Ms. Williams brought it to my attention, and we brought it to the city's attention, and it was a great addition. Um, although the attendance was a little light, I think that we had a great attendance at the event, and we had great entertainment. The lineup was great. The, the food was great. The, like everything, it was a great community event that would not have happened um, if it wasn't for the collaboration of the West Side School uh, Foundation, and also for the city. Uh, you know, the city came in, and uh, in, in, to Mrs. Williams' credit, she, she brought the idea, the city found some resources because it was not budgeted for, which uh, we, we should have done a better job. Uh, this, this Centennial Commission Thank stepped you. up and helped, which was great. Other community leaders, thank you to KCP uh, for their contribution. I see Craig Knight here in the audience and others. Thank you all very much 
for that. Uh, it was just great. I mean, it really was. And I've said this, that it, it, it was a great historic West Side celebration, yet uh, it's a citywide celebration because it's the 100th, 100th yes. anniversary of the school and something that would go down in the archives of our great city forever. And, um, and, it, and it's just great that we did it. I, I am was really, really, really happy with it. And I know the community is very happy with it. So thank you all very much, especially thank you to Ms. Williams for going through all the meetings. Hey, look, our, our team, you guys, you guys weren't a part of it, but the team met uh, throughout the course of the year. I have to also give a thank you to some of my office, Harry Williams in my office, a special thank you for being as engaged. And they went to a lot of meetings, a lot of back and forth, bringing everybody together. This is not easy to do. And uh, through collaborative efforts that, that we, we saw the, the fruits of all you all's hard work. So thank you all very, 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 very much. Thank you, Councilman. Could I add one thing? Sir? You know, we've talked about all of our community partners, but we certainly have not mentioned Metro. Without Metro, none of this would have been possible. They had to okay. The, once I decided what the route was, then I met with them, and they decided how they could shore up the community that everybody would be safe and keep everything moving. So with that, I want to commend them for outstanding participation. They are a terrific group, I will tell you that. Yeah. Always there, always reliable, always care about the community first and last. Okay. With every breath they take. So Your Honor, if I may. Yeah. Yes, please. Brenda, thanks for your continued involvement in the community. I Thank you, Senator. When you left the Senate office, I hoped you'd be active, and you have uh, exceeded <laughs> my expectations. And thank you again for being a part of this. You're, you're part of the history. Not old enough to remember what happened 50 years ago. I recognize that. But uh, okay. thank you so much. <laughs> thank you. All the best. As uh, Carolyn, I think we're about. Yeah, they may be. <laughs> Thank you. Um, this is a report only, so we will conclude the report. And again, Jasmine, thank you. Thank you, Jonathan, too. Thank Wonderful you. day. Thank Great. you. Thank you. <clears throat> we'll move on to agenda item 9, 240011, CLC1, report from by staff from the Neon Museum regarding the completion of Duck Duck Shed, celebrating Las Vegas architecture, design, and Culture 2023 four-day event funded by the Commission for the Las Vegas Centennial and in regard to all walls, wards. Thank you. Hi. How are you? Happy New Year. Happy New Year to all of you. Thank you all very much. It's always a pleasure to be in front of the Commission. We are at the Neon Museum are so thankful to have the support of the Commission behind this new endeavor, um, taking something that is an idea and letting it germinate and, and see what sticks is a risky endeavor, but in a town that gambles, um, we appreciate you gambling on us. And so we're hopeful that you'll be thankful on what you'll see today. So Duck Duck Shed, um, we had our second year. Uh, in this slide, I'm excited to show you um, uh, Eric Strain, local architect and uh, well-known architect. He's actually leading a tour of um, architecture professionals and, and individuals who are going through the boneyard and taking the boneyard from a completely different perspective. So seeing it through a different lens. Now and I'm excuse me for one second. I'm a big fan of the I've been advised your name has escaped you. Pardon me? You did not mention your name. I for did the not record. mention my name. Forgive me. For the record, this is Aaron Berger, the executive director of the Neon Museum. I apologize. Thank, Thank you, you very did, much. I for didn't that. mean to get you off track. No, you you okay. did you did beautifully, and and um, unfortunately, I, well, hold on one second. I am going to go backwards. This is going to embarrass me further. So we're going to do this. Wait. Uh, can we make that play? Well, I'm a big fan of the new museum and I support virtually everything they want to do. And Duck Duck Shed is a great event that foregrounds that Las Vegas is not just a place of resorts and a place of entertainment, but it's also a place of cultural innovation. Duck Duck Shed is a four-day celebration of Las Vegas architecture, design, and culture. 
It is an opportunity for everyone from architects to just lovers of Las Vegas to take a deeper dive into the understanding of the craziness and what makes this the most desirable destination city in the world. I love the presentation today because Todd Fisher is a great orator and I just loved hearing the stories even though I have heard them many times. There have not been enough institutions in Las Vegas platforms to really understand how the city is changing, growing, and so what really struck me about Duck Duck Shed is it's just a collection of different perspectives, different conversations that does really provide that platform for analyzing the city. I thoroughly enjoyed myself as not just a participant, but as an audience. Even Jillian, in doing some of the research for today, was not aware of an awful lot of stuff that went on. And we all learned from this. I was just discussing that with Mrs. Wynn. We learned more about what we did because hindsight is 2020. And the Neon Museum has been one of those wonderful treasures that we've had that emanated organically. So that going forward, it's going to be really instrumental to be part of an even bigger cultural evolution here. You come to Vegas or you live in Vegas and you haven't seen what they do at the Neon Museum, you are missing out. And Aaron Berger is the visionary who is going to take us on that course and this is a great example of how he's doing it. There's a history that is really rich and robust and I love being able to explore that further. So that is our sizzle reel for, um, for, for 2023. To give you the highlights of what we accomplished, so first and foremost, we are very excited that now our programs, um, our panel discussions, are accredited by the American Institute of Architects. Um, it is a continuing ed credit, so we can attract people from across the country to come in and actually use their professional development dollars to come and attend and participate in DDS. We saw a 15% ticket increase over the year before, and that was a 22% increase in the total number of buyers. So we're getting that stickiness that we're looking for. We're starting to see traction in this. The most important part is that the sponsorship growth on this grew by 215%. So while we are incredibly grateful for what the Centennial Commission is providing for us, we're seeing others step up and support this endeavor as well. And we'll talk about budget in a second. Um, I wanted to also talk about reach. So this is very exciting for us. We reached four countries. Um, and 27 states throughout the US. So you, get a, you see that it's not the Southwest that's traveling by car to come to Las Vegas, but we have people who are coming from New England, who are coming from New York, who are traveling in to participate in this program and learn from what we're offering. Um, so we also had 31, 32%. These people are buying more than one ticket. So each program is individually offered. So they're buying more than one, which is great. Our goal is to, of course, create this into more of a symposium or conference, but this is our starting point. 93% gave this uh, out of a scale of one to five, gave it a, a rating of either four or five per, uh, on that scale. And then 98% said they want this to be an annual function. Looking at marketing, again, staying with the marketing, so how did we reach the 27 states and the four different countries that were coming to the, to the US and coming to Las Vegas? The marketing impact, 3.1 million people are seeing this on social media. Um, 2.4 million are actually watching the videos that we present. So it's one thing to put the video out there, it's another thing when they're watching the entire, uh, entire piece. 24 pieces received uh, national news coverage, which is a 41% increase over 22. So the, the biggest of which was we got a 10 minute spot um, with Todd Fisher talking about Debbie Reynolds that was on Fox News National. Um, it was pretty terrific. So the coverage included Forbes, Art Daily, as I mentioned, Fox News, the Architects newspaper, so being able to target some of these professionals that we want to bring into the, uh, into the uh, area as well. 
Our highlights, so we offered again this year, we did this last year as well, a free admission uh, exhibition that was er here in City Hall. We'll talk about that in the next slide. Um, we did panel discussions by industry le uh, leaders. So you saw Roger Thomas, the chief design officer under Steve and Elaine Wynn. You saw um, Elaine Wynn um, speaking, Jillian Wynn also speaking. We had Stefan Al, who's written an amazing book and actually really changed my thinking about Las Vegas, watching his. So we talk about Las Vegas in decades. He actually has movements and talks about movements. It's a fascinating lecture. Um, blew my mind. My mind's not that big, so that's probably <laughs> not a big accomplishment. Um, we expanded our offerings into the visual arts and also culinary. So we looked at the idea of this was the town known for being the 99 cent shrimp cocktail. How did we go from that to being Michelin star restaurants? So we did an incredible program and we did it in the arts district. We did not do it on the strip. We brought people to Main Street Provisions and made sure that people got to celebrate the locally owned and uh, important restaurants that we have here in our community. We also continued our downtown Las Vegas walking tours that have remained really popular. Um, this I'm really, really proud of because this is the first time the Neon Museum has actually curated and presented its own exhibition. We partnered with Todd Fisher, the daughter, I'm sorry, the son of uh, uh, Debbie Reynolds, and we put a free two-month exhibition in City Hall's Grand Gallery. Did anybody see that show while you may be wandering through? Yeah. So, yes, yeah, so we had, we had tremendous attendance, and it was an awesome opportunity to bring out the story of Debbie Reynolds, but specific to Las Vegas. That's what the story was. So it started with her 1962 Riviera dress that she wore on stage right after she had signed the first million dollar contract in Las Vegas for entertainment. Not only was that the first million dollar contract, but this was a woman doing it. She was breaking ground. And we really wanted to be able to tell that story. We also had the last costume or outfit that she wore on stage when she was at South Point. So to be able to show that career and show that breadth all here in the Grand Gallery and for free was an incredibly rewarding experience for us. We added Todd Fisher um, and bringing in uh, Debbie's son to be able to talk about his experience growing up with Debbie, some of which I can't ever announce or, or repeat. Mm -hmm. But it was fabulous. Um, we had some fabulous uh, re response from that as well. We did dinner with former Mayor Oscar Goodman. Um, not to gild the lily here, but the positive feedback was five out of five stars. He actually, in his program, received the highest ranking of all of our um, uh, programs that we did. Uh, we did this in, uh, in Oscars at the Plaza. And, <clears throat> excuse me, what was great was that while there is, the Plaza does offer dinner with Oscars now, uh, sporadically throughout the year. This was largely out of towners. So this is a group of people who've never met Oscar, don't know Oscar's stories to the level that many of us do. And so they got a chance to really hear and learn. The topic for the night was, what was your first mob accused client, your organized crime client? And how did your family feel about you representing this client. And from there, as you can imagine, the mayor um, expanded on the story. We'll put it that way. Um, so it was great fun. We had a ball. We had an absolute ball. Um, we also did a, um, a first program for us, which was a program for kids. So we did Duck Duck Shed for Ducklings. And this was getting kids into the world of architecture. We did this inside the La Concha. We brought in Andrea Loney, who is the author of a book called Curve and Flow, which is the book about, it's a children's book specifically about the works of Paul Revere Williams. And so in this, she got kids involved. We had an incredible outreach program with that. Again, first time we've done a family program, 4.6 out of five stars and really, really important for the, for the little ones. 
Our partners and sponsors, we are incredibly grateful to the people who joined us. Um, I'm most grateful of, of everyone. Everyone here gave money and, and thank you for giving money and we love you for that. The one that I'm really proud of is our partnership with UNLV. So in our partnership, we have extended free admission to the panel discussions for students so that they can come and hear from these industry leaders. We had students who were able to ask Elaine Wynn and Roger Thomas questions. And let me tell you, they asked tough questions. So it was fantastic. And again, taking away that barrier of money was a wonderful partnership that we were able to do. So that's my report on 23 before I get into my ask for 24. <laughs> uh, any comments, questions here? Yes, uh, Member Stoto. This is my confusion on my part, so if you can help clear it up uh, for me. Please. Uh, what was the increase in cost f over the, the first year? I would go back to something that you said at the beginning, which was that we're taking, the Centennial Commission was taking a chance on, on this event. Yeah. And, and I still have some concerns, not about the content, but just ab about the whole thing and how much it costs. And, and, and I think there are roughly 1,300 individuals that attended, not including students. We had over, we had close to 4,000. And, but the paid tickets? All, all of which paid. Everyone was paid except for the UNLV students. There were 22 U UNLV students that participated. I, I, I'm sorry, the, the 1,354, it says total buyers here. Total buyers through that, exactly. Total buyers through the system and then 4,000 overall coming through the weekend, whether they're participating in the Neon Museum or participating in the programming itself as a tie to the uh, highlight that's there. I, I really never was that good at math, but that, that's not my, my point. Okay. Is it's really, uh, how much did this year's cost sure. overall, including all the, the sponsorship, that, and I'm not worried about whether they, they sponsored, they gave you in kind. Sure. I'm really talking about whether the convention authority, I think, gave you some funds. So the convention of the uh, LVCVA, uh, allowed us to use their marketing team and gave us basically a month and a half, six weeks of marketing, which equated to about $50,000. And so it was, it was not a gift of $50,000, it was using their marketing team to market nationally. Which is which important. Were yeah. there any other uh, uh, financial direct cash transactions from, from sponsors, like the Centennial Commission gave you how much? Well, again, that was, it was $50,000 in, in sponsorship, again, going directly to marketing. No, Centennial Commission. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry, Centennial Commission gave $200,000. And, and who else gave you cash? Who else gave you cash? Everyone that's on this, this screen right now. For a total of? A total of, we brought in a total of, uh, the costs I know were three thirty six. dollars um, for as much as uh, revenue brought in, we would be around, Something around 375. 375, including the actual ticket sales itself. Okay, so so this the, the ticket sale is not a profit making for the Neon Museum per se. It is. It's rolling back into Duck Duck Shed. It's rolling okay. back into Duck Duck Shed. So while it's under the umbrella of our nonprofit, um, it, is, it is going back into Duck Duck Shed. Our goal is to get in, and I would say it would probably be year five, but our goal at that point is where we start seeing the travel and that this number of 4,000 is growing to 10,000, 15,000. This is moder modeled after Modernism Week in Palm Springs. Palm Springs is bringing in 170,000 people a year to come visit that very small community and learn about mid-century modern. That's, we're not focused on mid-century modern. That's not our focus. Our focus is architecture and the culture and the uniqueness of the city. But the model is what we're after, is drawing in people over a period of time. So we're looking at four days. Modernism week is actually 11 days. Right. Um, so we're looking at four days right now, hoping that by year five we're able to continue to grow it. 
we're able to come before the committee and uh, the commission ask for less money because we have more sponsors and more ticket revenue that's actually supplementing the need. You're heading towards my question, which is you see this being self-sustaining at some point. Is that the goal? That is absolutely five the goal. Five years, 10 years? Five years, is, five years is, the, is the anticipated goal. We have to keep going to see where we can go from here. I don't want to get to the next item, but if I could just with one question. Please. Is the upcoming request, is that more? Static. The same as this Same year's. amount, $200,000. Thank you. You're welcome. Do you want to make a motion? This is just a report. This right? is a report. Right. Oh. oh, it's not scheduled. Okay. This or is me this just start? showing you that, that you did, be? You did right. good things with the money, I no, hope. No, no, no. You've done a great <laughs> job here, and I don't know if there are any other comments. But, I mean, I yes, please, Ms. Selton. Thank you so much, Bob, because you got a lot of my questions. I was <laughs> wondering, though, you know, as you're, I know we're not going to be talking about your ask necessarily, but this is a perfect time to talk about what's going to happen this next year, just to see how it's building yes, with the number of events you had this year compared to what you plan for next year, um, just to get your sense of where it's. Sure. I'm absolutely very happy to tell you that, that with the next slide, I'll give you the dates and the and the the goal of being able to bring through. I do not have a schedule at this point because to have the schedule, I I need the funding first to be able to provide the schedule. We have started negotiations. Um, if I get what I want, you're going to fall in love with what is going to be in City Hall. You're going to be really excited for that. But I, I got to get it. I got to get it. They got to say okay. yes. But the asks okay. are out. The I'm asks are out. to go to 10. Anyway, you did a great, I'm waiting for any other comments, questions here. I'm a person that likes action today and now. I thought the report was terrific. I will only be stopped by our attorney. Uh, Mayor Goodman, Chair Goodman, Jeff Dorkin, City Attorney. Yeah, just because of the tenor of the discussion, why don't you go ahead and read number 10, which is the ask for this year, 2024. So uh, the discussion can essentially continue, but let's open number 10. I think you're the only attorney I like. I'm going to You're read number to 10. One. No, it was a great report. It was very thorough. Um, and I just love your sponsors. I think everything's great. And I can go home tonight and tell Oscar. You got fives all the way, and he'll, he'll be quiet, which I love. So I'm going on to item number 10, which oh, you always have to ruin. I know that Oscar suffers from uh, inferiority complex. Yes. You think he really needs another boost? <laughs> he does. <laughs> you live with him. You can share that with him oh privately after the meeting. Oh Thank my you. God. <laughs> You're terrific. Thank you. All right, we're going to go and read number 10. That was a report only, which unless somebody has any problem, I'm going to go ahead on behalf of the commission and accept the report as presented. We're going on to item 10. Thank you, Mr. Dorkak. 23066 CLC 1 discussion for possible action regarding approval of the grant request for $200,000 by the Neon Museum for the costs associated with planning and running of the Duck Duck Shed celebrating Las Vegas architecture. Design and Culture 2024 four day event to be held in the fall of 2024 and authorizing the president to execute the grant agreement is approved by the city attorney, and this is in reference to all wards. Is there yes. anything else you would like to now make a little comment here? I, I will make just a few, a few I mean, remarks. I mean, I'm all set up here. I got one. I, 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 know, I know the questions are coming, and I'm ready for you. Uh -huh. um, so, so here are the dates. So we are picking deliberately the first weekend of, Las of uh, October. One of the things that is a learned lesson from last year was that we went Wednesday through Saturday at the encouragement of LVCVA trying to bring in more midweek traffic. Um, we're going back to Thursday to Sunday to, because I think at, in these beginning stages, we wanna make sure that we're getting as much weekend traffic as possible to come through. So we are going through October 3rd through the 6th. We are expanding our citywide focus and, and really kind of keeping this. Um, I love that my team, thank you very much for putting this slide together in which we have legends, Elaine Wynn, Roger Thomas, the backs of their heads and I'm the one being featured. So I just thank you for that, that's, that's great. Um, the anticipated audience. So this, um, Commissioner Stodel, uh, hopefully speaks to where our 
our history has been and where we're hoping to go. So if you look at 22, our goal was to reach 1,500 and we reached 3,200. Our goal was to reach 3,500 in year two and we made it to 3,943. Our goal for 24 is to go to 4,500. Again, continuing the growth, but trying to be smart growth because I don't ever want to stand in front of you and say we didn't reach a goal. Your Honor. Please. No, I was asking oh, if I could speak. Please. May I speak? Please. Okay. Um, I, got, I got another target for you. Uh, there's a lot of movement happening right now to save an old building on Charleston and 7th or 8th. It's uh, an old savings and loan building or something, but it's built well, more than 50 years old. In front of this old building, which used to be a savings and loan, stood for all these years a statue of a Minuteman or something, rifle, maybe he was on a horse, I forget, a revolutionary type Minuteman, okay. and that was just their logo. But it was there all these years. Now it's gone, and I hope it hasn't been destroyed. I'm just curious if you've heard anybody talking about it? I have not heard about that piece in particular, but I can tell you, so the Neon Museum's history, our history has been that we've been very passive. We have waited for others to come to us and give us yeah. sort of the remnants. Um, that has changed in the last year. We have become much more aggressive in trying to capture pieces, whether they are signage or they are uh, plaques on the front, or in this case, a statue. It was a freestanding, um, pretty high thing, very notable. I just wanted to raise the attention to your people, and maybe thank someone you. has heard about, oh, that ought to be over in the Neon Museum, even though it wasn't made of neon, and with it wasn't our, on a strip hotel. Our biggest challenge is that um, with, with each of these things, uh, there are, there are properties that even when they recarpet, and many of you know who I may be talking about, even when they recarpet, they sell off the squares of the carpeting and make enough to actually recarpet the facility. So we're competing against other uh, collectors that take these pieces out from, out from uh, public protection and museums protection. So we have established in the last 12 months, uh, 18 months, we established something called the Barbara Mulaski Acquisition Fund. It is named after Barbara because she was our first president um, and the Mulaski family stepped up and, and seeded this fund. This is allowing us to go in and compete with collectors and say, but let us put our name the, at the table and let us have a seat at the table so that if it is um, a $15,000 or $150,000 item, we have an opportunity to purchase it and make sure that it ends up in safe hands. Well, thank you very much. I don't consider that a charge from this commission. Just say it's my interest, that's all. In no, I think it's, a, it's an important interest and this is the way the museum is reacting to that interest. Thank you. Yes. Um, yes, please. Mills for the record. Bob, I used to play under Sorry, that sign oh, when I was like five years old, and the, the, the last time I saw it, it, it was concrete poured over a, a metal uh, rebar, and it had disintegrated on the bottom terribly, so I would be surprised if that statue is still surviving now. I'll, I'll do digging. Thanks. I'm happy to do digging. I, yeah, it's amazing what we try and say. We tried to save the crazy horse too. I mean, I, there's all kinds of things that we're trying to save because they tell the story of Las Vegas, right? So the signage of the crazy horse too, not the you know performers. But the um, we we save the performers. But the idea is that we are working diligently to be proactive so that things like this don't get lost and our history doesn't get lost. We really do consider ourselves preservationists at heart. Okay, point of information for you. Please. Um, starting Wednesday evening, October 2nd, and running to Friday, October 4th, is Rosh Hashanah, which is part of Thank you. the significance in the Jewish faith. And on the 12th will be Yom Kippur. So um, not that you have to change anything, no, no. but inclusively. Um, you, you are might absolutely look right. At your Thank dates. you for that enlightenment, mm -hmm. Mayor. I'm okay. embarrassed that we didn't notice that first. Okay. A couple of quick Thank questions. You. One is sold off of the record. Um, 
my concern is is not for the survival of the Neon Museum. It will survive. It's for the growth and the development. Are any of the funds, is Duck Duck Shed in any way, is it supporting the organization? Uh, do, do, are any staff salaries uh, part of, part of the, do they get paid for any of this? Is any? Can, you, can I ask? I'm going to ask Jennifer Clevin, um, who's our Director of Advancement, and she can speak to the grant. I just want to make sure that I don't misspeak about the how we apply in the grant in this. Jennifer Clevin, for the record, hi. Um, so with our Centennial Commission grant, we don't have any staff salaries that are directly paid from it. That's not an unallowable cost. Right. We have a contractor, but overall, Duck Duck Shed does raise money, and it does supply funding for our staff. So when we're getting sponsorships, the ticket sales, that goes to our staff salary so that they can continue research and development of new programs. So, uh, uh, Diane, uh, Dr. Seabrand, I was, uh, is that, that's a correct thing, that uh, any centennial grant money cannot be used for staff salaries of a foundation? No, it can't be. It's just we have the cap of $30 an hour. Okay. Except for, sorry. for the record, that's, for working on this specific project, whether that is staff from the museum or their consultants or contractors. And we, we do have those those in, into effect um, we, as far as consultants, and then staff certainly does work on this project. We've not applied that towards this grant. That's correct. That's coming out of sponsorship funds, but overall, yes, between the grant, sponsorship, ticket sales, it does underwrite some of our staff salaries, absolutely. Okay, okay. Yep. Um, and how do you determine that, I just noticed our ticket, ticket prices were different. How do, how, is, how do you arrive at the dollar for the particular event? It, it depends on the event itself. So um, any of our panel discussions, we, we range from free, like the exhibition that was here, um, up to, I think it was $250 uh, to, to attend the dinner with Oscars, um, uh, dinner, with, dinner at Oscars. Uh -huh. So it just depends on the, the costs of the evening, um, the, uh, but all panels, so whether you're seeing Roger Thomas and Elaine Wynn, or you're seeing uh, maybe a, an author, a book author from that may not have the, the notoriety, um, those are $25 across the board, and it's anywhere and everywhere in between, depending on, again, costs or uh, uh, what the market will bear. Great, thank you, thank yeah. you. Any other questions, comments? Because I would entertain yeah, a motion yeah, then. I just have one, yes, Your Honor, uh, Commissioner Bryan. Uh, oh, there you are. I think what, what you do at the museum is, is absolutely sensational. Growing up here brings back so many fond memories. I love it. When you made your first presentation, I still had trouble duck, duck. I know. Now, now, if you're trying to reach an audience beyond the architectural community who probably understands this background historically, I would think that would be an enormous impediment. I happen to like history, uh, but I mean, uh, duck, duck doesn't register with me at all until I've heard your presentations over the past couple of years. Is there any pushback on that or say, gosh, what is Duck Duck? I mean, how does that reach a broader <laughs> duck, duck audience? Shed, right, yeah. Duck Duck Shed. We do get questions about it, we do, um, from everybody who's not an architect, we do get that, that question. Um, we felt that it was important, the reason that we felt that it was important to do was that it's, it is specifically from a book tied to Las Vegas architecture, not just architectural terms in general. So there is a route to that. Um, we could come up with a snazzy, fun name, um, but the hope is that you actually go through and look at the programming itself and say, I, I don't want to miss Roger Thomas talking about his his 20-year career after building Bellagio, um, which is what we're working on now, um, or these other programs that are going through. So the name I know causes causes some, some angst amongst some of our uh, uh, 
commissioners and, and some others. It is something that we look at. We look at Coachella. We look at South by Southwest. We look at even TED Talks. These things didn't have meaning at the time, and now they're just accepted as what they are. We believe this will this will come on and go forward. So, you know, we could we could do Las Vegas now with a giant exclamation point or something like that, but to root it in its in its intention and be intentional in our effort, Duck Duck Shed makes makes sense. But if we keep getting pushback from you, Senator. I'll listen. I'm well, always I'm, open. I'm to I was going to suggest uh, ASB. ASB? Yeah, Architectural Super Bowl. Ah. <laughs> Just I'm in. Tie into the. We'll get the athletics in there too. I'm all in. I'm all in. So I'd like to make a motion that we approve 23 0668 CLC1. Uh, regarding approval of the grant request for $200,000 by the Neon Museum in connection with the program currently called Duck Duck Shed. I second it. <laughs> okay. Uh, <coughs> Senator Bryan seconded the motion. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Unanimous. Thank you. It means a lot to us to have your support. It means a lot to us that you uh, believe in this budding growing opportunity. So we hope you'll join us for, for this year. It will be fun and different, quirky and weird, just like Las Vegas. It's wonderful. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Thank you. Okay, we'll move on to agenda item 11-230669, CLC1, discussion for possible action regarding approval of a grant request for a million five by Dapper Companies for the costs associated with creating planning and design documents for the restoration and rehabilitation of the Hundridge Theater and restoration work on historic elements of the theater located at 1208 East Charleston Boulevard, authorizing the president to execute the grant agreement is approved by the city attorney. This is in Ward 3 with Councilwoman Diaz. And Siebert, for the record, the applicant has asked to obey this item to the March 25th meeting. And that will be my motion then to go ahead and obey this to the March, what did you say, 21? So moved. 25. Yep. Thank you. And a second, did you say, uh, Member Brian? Yep. Thank you. It's a motion and uh, all in favor, please signify by aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstention? The motion carries. And by the way, Member Coffin, uh, you may want to talk with Mr. Dapper about that building and that statue. I have been contacted by him. So you might give him a call. We'll move on to agenda item 12, 230670 CLC 1, discussion for possible action regarding approval of a grant request for $388,120 by the Nevada Preservation Foundation for the costs associated with planning and running the 2025-26-27 Home and History events and authorizing the president to execute the grant agreement is approved by the city attorney. This is in reference to all wards. Hi, you do great jobs. Please introduce yourselves and let's have your comments. Uh, Amy Raymer, I am the vice president of the board of Nevada Preservation Foundation. Jennifer Minucci, I'm an executive board Denver for Realtor Education. Wonderful. I'm Mitchell Cohen, I'm secretary of the board for NPF. Wonderful, thank you all for your work and let's hear from you. Awesome, thanks. Do you have the presentation here? Is it? Uh, is it Jeff, is there a presentation for this one? Did you send one? I sent one on Thursday. Hold on. <laughs> um, I, I, whenever I hit send, I, no, I forward I it to the board members. Oh yeah, I can, I can do it. I, mean, I can, I can definitely sing and sing and dance here real quick if I need to. And there are mics on either side, and so if your light's on, it's live. Okay. Diana sent go. it to um, to Teresa. I don't. I had an email from her, and so I responded back to her with it. Do you want me to trail list for 10 minutes or something? Yes, please. 
Okay, Sorry. so if you don't have a seat, we'll go, sure. we'll bring you right back as soon as we found the uh, missing piece. Sure. We'll go to agenda item 13, 240012CLC1. Discussion of possible action regarding approval of grant modification number one concerning commission of the Las Vegas Centennial grant number 220499CLC1 to the 300 Stewart Avenue Corporation DBA, the Mob Museum for the costs associated with the production of a documentary film highlighting the history of the building as a U.S. Post Office Courthouse and Museum located 300 Stewart Avenue yeah, right. to extend the grant deadline from November 30th, past of 2023 to June 30th, 2024, and authorizing the president to execute the grant agreement as approved by the city attorney. This is Ward 5 with Councilman uh, Career. Hi. Hello. You've done great work. We're proud of you. Thank you. All right, Members so of the commission, uh, uh, for the record, Jonathan Ullman, president and CEO of the Mob Museum. I'm Jeff Schumacher, <laughs> vice president of the Mob Museum. So we uh, are here this afternoon to uh, update you on the progress of the creation of a documentary about our historic building. Um, I want to start off by saying, of course, that we are enormously grateful for the Commission's support of this project. Uh, to be clear, we are not asking for any additional funding for this. Uh, what we have is a documentary that is nearing completion that we feel that we have made uh, uh, some very good progress on, uh, but we are hoping uh, to have the support of the commission to extend the deadline for the completion of this film so that we can make it uh, truly special as we, uh, we think uh, it should be. So uh, we want to give you uh, some more detail about the uh, progress that we've made thus far, and then, of course, answer any questions that you might have. So, Jeff. Uh, and I think it was Member Mowbray who bought, brought this request forward, and everybody was most enthusiastic about your doing it. So, let's hear how great it's going to be. <laughs> Well, thank you. Uh, the, we put a lot of work into the documentary up to now, uh, and we put together, uh, I think, a, a very good first draft of the documentary. We shared that uh, with, our, with our committee, our content committee at the, of the Board of Directors of the Mob Museum, and uh, we got some great feedback from that group that suggested we needed to do a little more work, that we uh, could focus a little more on the building's uh, role in the community, uh, and not just these sort of big news events that happen there, which there are many, but also some of the smaller things, the importance of the building and the community. So uh, that's the first thing uh, that we uh, need to keep working on uh, before we can complete it. Uh, and the second is that we wanted to uh, spend a little more time and effort on uh, explaining the challenges that were faced by the individuals who who wanted to build the Mob Museum in that building. In other words, uh, the uh, members of the city uh, staff, uh, the, the city council, and the committee, and then ultimately the board that were created to, to create the, the museum faced uh, you know, uh, objections from the community, they faced uh, financial challenges, they faced a variety of different uh, obstacles that needed to be overcome. And so we want to do a little bit more on that uh, to, uh, in, the, in the documentary. Long story short, we want to we wanna really go from, uh, to borrow a phrase, from good to great uh, with the documentary. It's, it's good now, it, it can be better, and it will be better uh, with just a little more time. Thank you. Um, I know, and hopefully you get a list of all the families that had mailboxes there, because yeah. I remember in these past 11 years, Councilman Member Coffin used to tell us that he, that's where his family mailbox mm -hmm. was. So I don't know who else had a mailbox. I'm sure the Mowbrays. Uh, so. <laughs> okay, 1965, it's wonderful. Well, um, unless there are any questions, any questions from anybody? We got a motion ready to go. Everybody's cool. Thank you for that suggestion, Member Mowbray. Uh, we have a motion here. Go. I'd like to make a motion to uh, for this is agenda item 13. 
13, which is 24-0012-CLC1, action on a grant modification number one concerning the commission on the Centennial Commission, grant 22-0499-CLC1 to the Mob Museum to extend the grant deadline from November 30th of 2023 to June 30th of 2024, authorizing the president to execute the grant agreement okay. as approved by the city attorney. Thank you, and may I have a second since we're into that? Second. Member Mowbray is seconding. All in favor signify by aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstain? Motion carries unanimously. Thank you. I'm going to steal some thunder from the documentary that uh, had an opportunity. Not only was there a battle to get the mob museum in there, but there was a battle to have the courthouse built the northern part of the state. It was the first north-south split. The north said, you don't need anything. Your, Las Vegas isn't going anywhere. You don't need a courthouse. We'll give you a new post office, but you don't need a federal courthouse. Th this documentary is going to be fantastic. It already is great, but it's going to be fantastic. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Wonderful. Yeah, I'd like to add a comment. Uh, when we talk about this project, uh, Mayor Goodman contacted me back when he first came in office and said, the GSA is determined surplus. Will you help get a home for this so they don't put a wrecking ball in it? Well, if you look around the country about all the buildings that have been declared surplus and then what happened to them, that would be a nice start instead of, you know, blowing up buildings on the strip and everything. I, well, I've got more comments, but we'll do that off offline here. Thank you. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Mayor, if I might add a comment. Uh, yes. I think what Jeff was talking about is terribly important. When the Mob Museum first got into public discourse, I was asked to join the group. And I said, I don't want to, there's a pay-in to the mob. The thing that made a big difference for me is Ellen Knoll, the FBI. She was a special agent here in charge. And when she joined the board, I knew that it was going to be a balanced presentation. So congratulations. Thank you. Farewell. OK, where are we still with uh, 13, uh, is it 13, 12? Or do we have that? Kim, three? Mayor, um, see for the record, can we take uh, number 14 first and then we'll We can take all the back. way to 21. I'm on a uh, roll here. <laughs> you just put up a little flag, you're ready, OK? Mm -hmm. Number 14, 24013 CLC1, discussion for possible action regarding approval of grant modification number three, commission for the Las Vegas Centennial grant number 220150 CLC1, uh, to the Economic Opportunity Board of Clark County for the costs associated with the production of a documentary film of the 50-year history of KSEP radio station located 330 West Washington Avenue, Suite 101, to extend the grant deadline from November 30, same deadline, 2023, but to February 28th. We're in February 2024, <laughs> and authorize, you're in trouble. <laughs> oh my, and authorizing the president to execute the grant agreement is approved by the city attorney. This is Ward 5, Councilman Creer. Hi. Happy New Year, good afternoon, yes. your honor, and members of the commission. My name is Craig Knight, for the record, general manager of KCEP 88.1 FM, and I have with me. Uh, Lawrence Beasley, executive director, Economic Opportunity Board. And we're here to ask for an ex uh, modification extension. However, our plans are to have a private screening and public screening the last week of February for Black History Month. So if you could grant us that oh, extension, we will be ready to go. And we have a 60-second synopsis we would like to show you. We would like to see that. <laughs> Am I in charge of doing that? No. You uh, could oh. be if we don't pass this. I mean, real. Oh, that's the year we came. Before 1972, the vibrant fabric of Las Vegas black community had little voice. But then, a mere 10 watts of power ignited a revolution. In 1966, there were five black-owned radio stations in the United States. 
These, along with some of the standard stations, began to cover the civil rights movement and play R&B music. You know, one of the things that uh, I didn't understand and appreciate as much as I do now is that KCP is, was our community station. Get ready to vibe with the heartbeats that made the historic West Side Pulse, the voice that stood tall for the whole community, and the hope that proved even a 10-watt whisper can create history. This is the legend of KCEP, the little station that could not stop. Cute. Cute. I'll take that. <laughs> <laughs> but, said um, it's a tease, right? Yes. Good. So, um, and everyone, of course, will be invited to the private screenings. Dr. Seabrant will have that information in due time. And right now, what questions do you have for us? Any questions? Anybody? I think we're ready, and you're just uh, really under the axe if we don't pass this. So. Excuse me, Your Honor, I wanted to do that. This is a leap year, cause, so can we say February 29th instead of the 28th? Um, is that agendized? Do we have to postpone this? Uh? Every four years. Yes. yes. <laughs> Olympics and presidential elections. Um, how do we hand out Mr. Dorkak? It's a change of the printed word. <laughs> I mean, it, it, if he's serious, we can't do it, but we can give him a wink. We'll keep it at the 28th just so we can do it today. Excellent. Okay, well, I'll take that. Well, can he do it till the 20th? I want to move it to the 29th. It is leap year. Special Unique. day. We can't change it right here and now? Oh. We, can make a, we can make a motion to allow you to change it when the contract is signed. How's that? I second that motion. Our legal counsel indicates that's to be done. Uh, we, we, <laughs> go with the go with what's on the agenda, but you know the notations. It's noted 29th. You might have it ready by. It's fine. Excellent. Thank you. That's the first time he's been stumped. <laughs> All right, well, I'd go ahead and make a motion to approve 24-0013 yeah. CLC1 uh, to extend the deadline to February the 28th, 2024, <laughs> with a period, wink and a nod. Okay, <laughs> with a wink and a nod. All in favor, please signify. Aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstain? You're blessed. I will Thank scratch you. out 28 and put 29. Thank you, Your Honor. I appreciate Thanks. you. Good luck. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Look at that list. Beautiful. Okay. Uh, now he's, Mr. Floyd's disappeared we altogether. We have it. We have it. Oh, okay. <laughs> so we are on back to agenda item 12, which I read and we can get started again. Please re-announce yourselves for the record, if you would, sorry. Sure, I'm Amy Raymer. I'm the uh, Vice President and Programming Chair for Nevada Preservation Foundation. Jennifer Minucci, I'm a board member um, for Realtor Education. Thank you. Mitchell Cohen, Secretary of the Board of NPF. Thank you. All right, so without further ado, um, our, our presentation today, our focus today um, is for the, the next three years funding for home and history. So just as a quick kind of breakdown of, of where we've been and where we're going or what we hope to go, um, we are looking at for 2024 um, a 15% uh, uh, jump on our ticket sales. So we're looking at just about 14, um, 1,400 tickets for that one with a steady increase moving forward. So in terms of where we want to go, um, having this three-year funding um, really gives us the opportunity to grow every single year, all year. The problem that we have right now is that every year we, we have to wait, you know, put in the grant, do the whole thing, um, and so we're kind of on pins and needles for that. So this gives us an opportunity to kind of move forward and be really thoughtful with our programming. Um, additionally, to have more run-up time for that as well, too, to help us in the long run. Um, so again, this basically kind of um, connects to that as well too. 
um, it really um, ensures our stability, um, and we are at this point too, it gives us an opportunity. Um, we are already looking through other grants, um, other sponsorships, um, so that we can basically step ourselves down from support from the Centennial um, as kind of our incubator um, for, for giving us the money to, to run a lot of, well, to run this programming um, with the expectation that we've got a runoff and we are on our own feet and able to do this as an organization. Um, hopefully by 2027, we're able to do that. Um, again, this is the, the breakdown in terms of uh, what we are looking for. Um, again, 2025 breaks down to um, 1,071,600, ,001, which I believe is about 15,000 less than what we have asked this previous year, 2024. Uh, 2026, it steps down again to 23, um, 123,500, and then in 2027, 93,020 on that one um, for that full ask of the 388,120. Um, again, that really gives us the opportunity for um, having some, some strategy, um, some, having more of those opportunities to really connect with um, additional sponsors so we can step this down um, in, those particular, in that particular way. Um, in terms of our request as it relates to personnel, you can see that things step down from here. This is the main category that we're looking at removing um, centennial funding uh, because we want to make sure that our, all of our, our folks that we are hiring um, for these opportunities, we have these opportunities to fund them as an organization through our organization as it is. So um, our, our kind of focus on this is it does give us, like I said, that longevity for um, hiring a, um, an executive director. We're looking at that for June 2024. Um, and then again, um, having this be one of those critical parts of that position, as well as, um, as you know, preservation is in our name. And we've done a lot of that with education. We also want to step back and then make sure that we are still doing those projects that really started us back back then. So, like I said, um, it does give us that opportunity to offer that through that executive director. Um, again, in terms of uh, supplies and materials, you see that that steps down um, a little bit for the most part. Um, we, in terms of our, um, our supplies, um, we have been handling a lot of that when out of pocket from the organization. So, um, again, like I said, it's one of the smaller portions of the budget. Then finally, the one area that we are kind of keeping well-funded, and these are our third-party um, or our contracted services. Um, so to include um, videographer, um, having PR, uh, we have a phenomenal PR firm that we were able to hire for this year. Um, it does give us some, some connection with those organizations as well too. Um, they know us, um, they, they know how, how things work, and so it does give us that opportunity um, to say this, we've got a little bit, you know, we've got a three-year, four-year, um, connection here. So um, we got everybody's com comfortable with, with where they are. So um, again, like I said, the expectation, our focus is really to step down um, from the funding, is to grow ourselves as an organization through some of our sponsorships for this particular um, structure that we have here, while we continue to offer the amazing programming that we have been for, you know, since 2015 when we did our very first Vintage Vegas home tour. Um, additionally, um, we're very excited for next year, which is the 120th um, anniversary of our city. So we've got all kinds of things that we're excited to get going for next year. So this will give us an opportunity to even get moving faster on, on programming for that as well too. So, um, again, some of our partnerships that we have already done, we just even this year, um, having this additional funding, we were able to already start um, some of those additional partnerships. So we are well on our way um, to getting those uh, established as we move forward. Was security included and in which area? I didn't see that. That is an ever-changing cost that we deal with all the time, and I don't see anything there. Um, as, as of right now, um, it's not in the grant as you see it. Um, what, the way that we have, one of our biggest events is the gala, is the gala, and that has been connected to um, usually a larger organization, um, 
typically a, a larger hotel. So um, what we had last year, we had at the Westgate, we had the Elvis event at the Westgate, and that was provided through the Westgate. Um, the majority of our other events are not really large enough um, as they stand right now that we would need that. So um, that might be something that we would need to include in some of the other grants that we are working through right now. Well, I'm concerned about the homes, the private homes. The oh, we flying. do insurance on that. We have we have insurance policies and, and everything that goes that. And I'm we have all for that. I'm talking about human beings that are equipped in security to handle issues with which we're all dealing on a daily basis, mm -hmm. that you have that at a reasonable and growing rate included. Okay. Um, because all you'll have is one bad incident and that's the end of your home in history forever. Gotcha. We, um, as it stands right now, we, we can absolutely add that in. Um, as it stands right now, we have um, a, a very clear volunteer training that goes along with that. We do have for each one of the homes in particular, um, there are three volunteers that are with that home. Um, so with every single home tour that we have, there are, um, and they, they transfer out every, t every Three hours, um, two hours. Double shifts. Yeah, yeah, double shifts. So we do have we do have volunteers who are trained um, for those for those as well too. Mayor, I think the point's more than well taken. But I, the the question would be: Do you have any communication at this point, or have in the past, letting Metro know either because you're going to have additional traffic in the residential area, or do, do they know that this event is taking place? That's a really good point. Um, as of now, no, but we will definitely be adding that so that they are aware that those are going on during that weekend. I think it would be yeah. the first step. Yeah. Well, and there's a cost. I mean, I just look at that, but I know as I'm a home that's 55 years old or whatever we've been in it, um, it wouldn't be for anything on the part of one of your guests coming in that I would worry about <laughs> it because of the volunteer staff. I, it just, this is a very challenged time and I just, each home have somebody in security there who is able to handle and not your volunteer. Gotcha. Um, just to explore and see what that cost is. Okay. So it's just a recommendation and looking at it personally. Okay. Um, yes, question, Ms. Member Arnold. Let's, I think more of a comment. You might be the first applicant that's come before us to aggressively step down your request year after year. And I just wanted to say thank you for that. It's appreciated at least by me. Um, and I guess it, there's a follow-up question to, um, maybe it's to our executive director. If in the event they decide that this thing is growing and to the security question, I assume the door is open for them to come back to us and, and have that discussion, even if we do approve them for multiple years. See, for the record, that is correct. If but if there is an ask for further funding, it would have to be a separate item, and they would have to send a separate proposal. Okay. Any comments, questions here, um, member? Let me go there. Help first, and then next. Hi, Please. I just wanted to check in. See, I see that you've presented your partners. Do you have any funding outside of our grant for this yet? Right now, um, we are working. We've um, we've re received grant funding, in, in particular, we are in the process right now of grant funding, um, particularly with the um, uh, Clark County OAG, um, as well as um, again our big push. Our board knows as well too that partnerships are going to be what what we need to have here as well too. So, in terms of additional monies that are coming in, ticket sales is part of that as well too, um, including um, again our sponsorships for for the events that we have as well. But do you have a budget then that you know you, you're getting that money? Y yes. With, or is everything uh, with just the, the outside with the outside? Uh, agencies grant or mm -hmm. yes yeah we do that we are requesting um, and about how much is that one thirty thousand okay thank you and member coffin thank you mayor um, i had to step out for a few minutes and so i may have missed this so pardon me if um if i'm not mistaken you showed a segment of your budget which actually showed decreasing costs did you explain that because i apparently i couldn't understand why you showed a portion of your budget 
declining over the next two years? Um, based on some of our discussions that we've had, we wanted to make sure that we were stepping down from support from um, Centennial. Um, we fully understand, and one of the things that we try to do is, um, you know, with all of our, our, our promotions is, is people to get the, the license plates, things like that. So that is a large part of what we do. But one of the things that we want to show is that we can be sustainable. Um, you know, the, the Centennial Commission, we hope, goes on forever and ever. Um, but we want to say thank you and also, as an organization, be able to say we can, we can continue doing this, this, this activity with less funding, you know, through Centennial. I just wondered if it meant that you had uh, perhaps asked for too much and then realized, well, we don't need quite that much. Oh, get out of here. <laughs> I'm going to jump in. Um, I knew he'd ask. Yeah, no, it's going to be a challenge. There's, there's no two ways about it. It's going to be difficult to step down funding-wise. <laughs> I, I, I'm sorry, Mayor, if I can just jump in. The way I, I received it was you heard our yeah. concerns up here in the past with not only your application but others. And I know Russell Rowe in the past has observed these discussions, so I assume he's, he's uh, weighed in with uh, those concerns. The other thing that I noticed is that, in, well, you made the direct comment that you hope to internalize some of these uh, positions in the future as you guys grow as an organization, thus not needing additional funding from the outside. So that, that's the way I, I'm hearing the right things. I hope all the success in the world for you and you have my support. I hope. And, and still, for the record, I, that's how I took it. You listened to what uh, the commission, and you took the opportunity to get a multi-year grant, but also at the same time looking at the opportunities to get additional funding, reduce the cost. So I'd like to make a motion to approve 23-0670-CLC1, action regarding approval of grant request for $388,120 by the Nevada Preservation Foundation for costs associated with planning and running the 2025, 2026, and 2027 Home and History Events Tour. Madam Mayor. And there is a second. Yes. Over here, Councilwoman Who, Diaz. Where are we? Oh, <laughs> Councilwoman Can I just Diaz. ask a quick question because the previous uh, presentation triggered a question. So um, I think it was Mr. Berger who mentioned that Palm Springs has a similar tour and they have a robust uh, amount of attendees and so my question to you all is one um, what's the breakdown of the attendees I know that in 23 we had about 1200 am I recalling correctly from the presentation mm -hmm. so how many of them were local versus we, um, we have that US. breakdown and I didn't bring that part with me I apologize we did we did have um, some from out of state from last year that's been our big push based on our discussions that we had from previous um, centennial meetings was that um, we needed to we, we need to bring in um, folks from out of state so our our peer PR firms that we're working with right now we have a big push um, nationally um, for this to go out actually we have a um, we've got something going out on the wire um, Wednesday um, that you know that will go out nationally and then we have another one of those scheduled as well too um, so yes, we, we are very aware of that. We are, we are doing our very best to make sure that we're bringing those in. We're working with a, a, a hotel right now too in terms of having a host like hotel, so offering rooms um, through that particular hotel as well too, so we can kind of track that as well. Um, but yes, we are, and, and even our working with other like preservation groups, m direct marketing to them, these events as well too, um, as well. Because you know, um, modernism is awesome, but the, you know, it's been going for 21 years, um, so that's one of the things that we're, we're still growing that, but it is coming. And then I was going to, what was I thinking when, as you were speaking? Um, I think I lost. Uh, this is your number what? Um, how long have you been doing the Home and History Tour here in we Vegas? We started as um, just the Vintage Vegas Home Tour in 2015. In 2016 was our first Home and History, in particular, like when we branded it that. Um, so, yeah. Um, yeah, we're coming up on eight years. This eight is our ninth year. year. Yeah, this is our ninth year. Oh, that's my question. So um, for 24, you're looking to augment attendance by how many? How, I don't remember your um, number. It's, um, let me go back. <coughs> there we go. 
Um, so yeah, we're, we're hoping for that 15% for this year. I will say right now um, our home tour is more than half sold out. So we actually had to increase the numbers for the home tours. Um, we have just put out our second roll of tickets um, for events and at the first week of February we'll have even more events that will be coming out. So, um, you know, like I said, we're more than half sold out for the, um, for the home tour in particular. There comes my question, when are your dates for oh, this um, year? For 2024, it is April 25th through the 28th. Is there a way that we can receive that information so that we can plug it in? Absolutely. Um, I know that we have different ways to communicate to the folks that are also following things, and so it would be nice to help uh, increase your, um, just the number of members that are coming from the community, even at a local level, because I think we all kind of love to see the homes that you guys select and give us the history behind all of it. So if you can send that to Diane and if Diane can then share so we can absolutely. share, I think it would be awesome. Absolutely. Thank you. Yes, absolutely. Thank you. Member Strodal, another question? Dr. Seabrand, just uh, uh, the previous uh, for the, the documentaries and this one is a multi-year, each of the applicants, if granted, will still come back annually and give a report that's still part of the deal. They won't be three years before we see them again. That is super for the record. That is correct. They will have to come give a report each year. Okay, so it would be just really nice to get, get that update and, and, and to see how this, uh, and, and to point out, there was, of course, the issue in 2021, so you had to almost start all over again. So yep. we do have a motion. Okay, we have a motion and a second by Member uh, Mowbray. All in favor, signify by aye, please. Aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstention? Motion carries unanimously. Thank you, Thank you, very, you, much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank With you for waiting. Mr. Mowbray, the, um, we're going to have a Mary Crest part, uh, a tour this year. So just so you know, we've got okay. a Mary Crest coming. And if you'll give it to uh, Dr. Seabrandt, that will be great. And since she's on right now, this is report item number 15, report by Executive Director of the Commission of Las Vegas Centennial regarding completed projects and announcements relative to the Commission for the Las Vegas Centennial. Thank you, Seba, for the record. So for all the Centennial funded projects, everything is in progress. Some of these you just discussed today regarding extension on the radio documentary. The digitization project um, with Classic Las Vegas and Len Zook is in progress. Uh, 1960s documentary is in production, as we heard earlier this afternoon. Um, it's in the editing stage. We also have two other documentaries, West Side and El Dorado documentaries, oh, and of course the Mob Museum documentary, again, all are in progress, nearing completion. The La Concha lobby um, upgrades and repairs are in progress and going well. El Dorado Parade and the Las Vegas Days Rodeo will be now the El Dorado Days Rodeo are both in pre-production. Uh, we just heard Home and History and the Historic West Side Guidebook Design Design Guidebook is we had our kickoff meeting for that last week and it's moving forward um, with meeting with the, the community in West Las Vegas. And as was mentioned by Jasmine earlier for the um, uh, report for the Historic West Side School. This is the plaques that plaque that they gave um, us, and they gave um, this same plaque to e everybody that attended in the um, the parade and the event. And happy to take questions. Uh, if I might add, whatever happened to the historic preservation for the Golden Steer Restaurant on West Sahara? So I did meet with them and I went to the um, establishment and I took photos of the interior and exterior and I asked them for any old photos and they said that they are not the owners and they need to talk to the owner to see if that owner, I'm, I don't know who it is, will um, agree to be on the um, okay. register. So you keep us posted if you There's would. The other one is, if you'd inquire, is what happened to the one for Chicago Joe's on 4th? Um, did they ever receive their historic registry? There's the second one, if you could just so inquire. So, since I have been here, they have not applied, but I'm happy to reach out to them and ask okay. them if they would like to be on the register. Because I think their name was submitted to previous councils. 
um, and I don't know when I was thinking of the golden steer, just if those both died or they're alive. So, great I would imagine question. Commissioner Stodal would remember if um, old Chicago Joe's, was that ever submitted? Yeah. Mayor, I've got a question if I may. Who, if I might inquire, did you actually talk to at the Golden Steer? It's a locally owned business. Mike Signorelli yeah. is the owner. My, but he's not the owner? He is the owner, but the, he, it's being run by the next generation. Yeah, he's the owner, isn't he yes, still? Yeah. I think so. And I think he's got relatives uh, that work Except. actively in the restaurant. So you may have talked to one of them too. But no, I, I spoke with um, him and uh, the... Amanda. And Amanda, Nick. yes, thank you. Yeah, I spoke with both of them and they contacted me and said that they weren't legally the owners, so I... True. I'm waiting to hear back from them, and yes, I still need to get uh, the information from them. But all I can report is yeah, what they told yeah. me. Okay. Has there been any difficulty getting in touch with them? Were they reluctant to call mm -hmm. you, or no? I'm I'm in touch with them. Um, okay. I'm okay. waiting for them to get back to me. Um, I'll reach out to them again. I haven't okay. heard from them in about two weeks, but okay. I'll reach out and to just them again. Let me know. <laughs> okay. Uh, It'll be okay, an easier conversation than the one with Formula One. I know that. So, you, you'll you'll do fine. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. All right, we're going to move on to agenda item 16. This is apropos discussion regarding topics for future agenda items. Comments made during this portion of the agenda by individual members shall, shall refer solely to the proposal for the future agenda item, and any discussion shall be limited as to whether or not such proposed items are within the purview of the commission and or whether such proposed items shall be placed on a future agenda. No discussion shall occur. So anybody with a future emerging issue they would like on the agenda? Is that a hand from Member Arnold? Well, I do have a question for Mr. Floyd. If there's any update on another item we had discussed at the last meeting. Yeah, so at the last meeting, thank you, Seth Floyd, for the record. At the last meeting, there was a request to put <clears throat> a future agenda item on to discuss the website. Uh, following that meeting, a group of, I believe, four of the commission did meet uh, to go over some suggestions and talk through a process for making some changes to the website <laughs> and getting some more information out. And we met with Councilman Creer this morning on the report from that group, and I think we have some direction going forward. We didn't put it on this meeting because we didn't really have anything to report just yet, but uh, based on our conversation this morning, we should have an item ready for the March meeting for the commission to potentially take action on some steps that would, uh, I, don't, I, don't wanna, I don't know what the direction exactly is going to be, but to make those improvements that were suggested by the small group to the website. So those will be coming back in the future. Yeah, so we already have Thank that you. on the list for future agenda items. Thank and our, I just talked to Diane about that earlier. We should have that on the March. Wonderful. Uh, so, so for the record, I, actually, I think this really falls more under the previous. I think we moved ahead of the, uh, this could be part of the executive director's report, uh, agenda 15. Uh, and, and that is, at the last meeting of the Centennial Commission, the mayor appointed four people to a working group and was told uh, uh, that the working group would come back and have a report to the, the Centennial Commission Commission at this meeting. And yes, that's correct that we in fact did have a, a meeting, a, a very productive meeting with Councilman Creer and uh, uh, exchanged action opportunities uh, to create a website for the Centennial Commission. Uh, my, my question then is, uh, Seth, is, is what process are we going to use to get from A to an agenda item at the March meeting? Is this simply something that's going to be done internally by the city staff, or as he is getting grouchy, will the Centennial Commission working group be, this is, this is not a presentation or proposal by city staff. This is a proposal by the Centennial Commission, which may be in contradiction to what the city staff wants. So how are we going to get to the presentation of what the Centennial Commission would like to see done rather than what the city staff would like to see done? How do we 
merge those two to where we're both on the same page. Yeah, so Commissioner Seth Floyd for the record. So that specifically that process is we are going to meet internally as staff to make sure we have all the logistics of what that group wants to accomplish ready to present. Then the small group is getting back together with city staff to, f to figure out how we're gonna do it. Because there's a few options. For, from what we discussed this morning, there's a few options for how to proceed. And I don't yet know what the agenda item will look like. For example, if we decide to hire a consultant, we can do that in a couple of ways. We can reach out to a consultant and put that contract on. We can do an RFP so that we get some, we can solicit some input from uh, some professionals who can help identify that information and put it in the format that we want. Uh, but we need to have a conversation internally first with IT and communications, because when I reported last week, one of the things I mentioned was that there's some practical concerns that we have to get through, which they're resolvable, but we have to talk with communications and IT, and then we're gonna circle back and have our staff meet with the small group to go over the suggestions that came out of the meeting and then formulate the item that's gonna go on the March agenda. So and what? so the depth yeah. of what you can be discussing today, as it says here, has to be very limited. It's just an item we can put on a future agenda. And uh, we I'm should sorry. Be going well, into uh, actually, we're still on the, the report by the executive director. Um, that's what we backed up to so we could have this discussion. Uh, so the question then is... Jeff Dorkak, City Attorney, just for the record, I don't think we backed up to that unless, Mayor, did you reopen that item? Um, no. If you'd like to, you can, but just uh, for everyone's knowledge, but y y the Mayor's right. We don't want to go into too much depth here, I think, um, and I'm not stifling it at all, but y Seth knows how to lay out an item for the March agenda to capture everything that you guys would discuss on it. I'll wait for the public comment period where I can be a little much more positive. No. And Mayor... Yes. If you don't mind, I, real quick, I, I do want to say I apologize, Seth. My intention was to have a conversation with Bob prior to the meeting. Unfortunately, I only have his house number until today. So when he gets home, he'll know that I called this morning to speak to him and give him a little bit of a heads up. And I'm so happy he's not listening to my comments now. Anyways, sorry. Thank you. I tried. Okay. So the conversation then will be, no, I think because of everything that's proceeded and doing this type of thing, we'll go ahead, we'll have you speak in public comment, but are there any other emerging items that anybody would like to bring up? Mr. Mills, Ms. Diaz, Mr. Mulberry, anybody? Are we still here? Yes, we are. Okay, no emerging items, so, um, you're very lucky, Dr. Seabrand, except now we're going to go into our second uh, public uh, participation, <laughs> 17. And who's ho so heavily breathing? Commissioner Brandenburg. Mark, He's on the are phone. you okay? My goodness, I've been wondering who is that in the background? That's me. <laughs> oh, my gosh. No wonder you're not here. I hope you're well. Are you well? I, I'm doing okay. Thank you so much for asking, Mayor. I'm going to call you right after the meeting to be sure. Anyway, stay oh. well. I know we have one seat here, and we have, yes, the two seats. Okay, who's missing here on my left? Hannah. Oh, H Hannah, she's not on? Oh, I hope you're doing well. All right, we're going to move on our empty seats. This is terrible, but you're a heavy breather. Okay, we'll move on to our second item number 17. Uh, citizen participation. Public comment during this portion of the agenda must be limited to matters within the jurisdiction of the commission. No subject may be acted upon by the commission unless the subject is on the agenda. Schedule for action. If you wish to be heard, come forward. Give your name for the record, the amount of discussion on any single subject as well as the amount of time any single speaker is allowed may be limited. Okay, here we are. Go for it. Still off for the record, the, at the last meeting of the Centennial Commission, there was discussion uh, by the commission uh, that uh, there was concern that after, I think, more than a year of, of or several years, there were requests by the Centennial Commission to uh, uh, create a process to create a Centennial Commission website which would list all of the grants and, and all of the uh, 
uh, the video and all the elements uh, along with an accurate history of the creation of the Centennial Commission. There's a great deal of, of information that, that needs to be uh, 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 presented to the public. Part of that process was the mayor created a four-member working group. It doesn't have any authority, it's just a working group. Uh, uh, and the idea was at this meeting, the working group would come back with a report that the Centennial Commissioners could then discuss publicly about what are the opportunities. As part of the uh, setting up of the, the first meeting with Councilman Creer, um, the, the city asked the members to review the existing city website, which we did, and included a 22 single page report on the significant opportunities, historic opportunities that the city's website has. And I use the word opportunities for improvement as opposed to some critical term, uh, which I won't go into, but there are significant, significant opportunities for improvement on the city's existing website regarding the Historic, the Historic Preservation Commission, the Centennial Commission, and just how the city, through its communication department, reports on historical elements where there are several significant opportunities for improvement. And so we met and, and uh, decided that the best road that we would like to bring before the Centennial Commission uh, would be a discussion, a public discussion of creating a website. One of the questions was raised about whether or not the Centennial Commission has the unilateral authority to go out and hire a consultant or do we need to go through the city process and hire an RF uh, 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 send it out for bid. That was one of the questions that we were hoped to get an answer to today. So I, I'm the, the question about whether or not uh, I can unilaterally share the report that was prepared uh, 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 by the, the, the members of the, the working group, whether that's appropriate to share with the other commissioners at this point, um, or how we, how we can go forward with that. Uh, uh, and, and I guess this is just public comment rather than any discussion in, in between. But there's two opportunities. One, for the Centennial Commission's website to provide the public with all the information, documentaries and reports in one place, and secondly, uh, uh, the opportunities that the city has to really clean up its website. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm not to make comments back, but I will privately after this um, because I had questions too. But I think that we're all allowed to have the opportunity to get into it. This is not an emergency that has to happen in my opinion. Um, certainly it could wait the month or whatever, as long as you do it, do it right. Um, this is uh, open public comment. Uh, do we have anyone else? We have two very patient people waiting out there. <laughs> or is one of you forced so, to be here for academic uh, credit or something? <laughs> no. Aren't you nice? Mayor I hope Sutton. you get a raise. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you do too. Or a vacation, one of the two. Mayor, Seth Floyd for the record. So, Mayor, uh, Candace and Nina are on my team. This is Nina's first day in this role. Um, she is a new uh, management analyst on our team. Bravo. She may be providing some support to Diane for some of this work, uh, the, this laundry list of work that Diane has on her board. So I asked uh, Nina to come and watch this commission meeting so she can Beautiful. get a feel for what you all do. Thank you for your patience and your kindness and no questions. We appreciate it. If there are no other comments, then we will close public comment and this meeting is adjourned. Thank you members all. Appreciate it. And staff, thank you. Anyway.